So I'll just, I'll just kick off. The, the, the IMF and its sister organization, the World Bank, were set up at, at a United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference in Bretton Woods in New Hampshire in 1944. Um, at this conference, 45 countries got together to discuss post-war economic reconstruction. Remember, this is the context of uh, the aftermath of the Great Depression and obviously the, the, the Second World War um, and the new realities of post, the post-colonial uh, world order and uh, the U.S. emerging as, as one of the superpowers in the international system. Um, the IMF had originally been conceived as a, as a provider of short-term loans to bring stability to countries experiencing financial difficulty. Um, but you should remember that, like the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions were international in institutions set up ostensibly to bring stability and regulation to the international arena and to encourage trade and cooperation and to take into account all the interests of all member nations. Uh, but these institutions were and are far from democratic or egalitarian. The IMF, the World Bank, in fact, very closely reflect the power of, and interest of the world's dominant economic and political interests. Voter power of the IMF nakedly reflects the economic clout and relationship to each of, to the US of each member state. So therefore the United States, with 4.5% of the world's population, has 17% of the vote of the IMF. Ireland has 0.7% of the vote as against 0.065 of, of the world's population. Whereas the whole of Africa with 16% of the world's population has just 16% of the votes collectively. Uh, moreover, any constitutional or major policy change at the IMF requires an 85% weighted majority, uh, effectively giving the US on its own with its 17% the ability to veto any change. The IMF's economic policy has naturally also reflected the economic theories which correspond to, to, to the dominant economic and political ideologies of each time. Thus, from their foundation, the, founda the policy of the Bretton Woods institutions were largely influenced by the, by the ideas of John Maynard Keynes, whose Keynesian economic policies sat relatively well with a Western post-war social democ democratic compromise. Keynesianism, nationally as well as internationally, favoured countercyclical economic measures, putting money into the system where it was needed through public expenditure when there wasn't growth, and taking it out of the system through taxes when growth was too fast. The 1970s saw a recasting of the IMF's policies in line with a rising new orthodoxy in, in Western economic thinking. This new orthodoxy, the brainchild of Milton Friedman, Friedman and his Chicago boys, had already been tested in the laboratory of Chile in the aftermath of the violent overthrow of the popular government of Salvador Allende. Now it enjoyed the impetus given it by the Thatcherite and Reaganite revolutions in their domestic economies. This new orthodoxy, also called monetarism, would soon become known as neoliberalism in the, in the majority world, where the movement to challenge it is growing. When the Chicago boys got their hands on IMF policy, they made the IMF itself into an ideological policeman. IMF conditionality on the loans that extends to, to recipients in fragile emerging economies requires them to open up their economies to multinational and finance capital while also demanding the stripping away of anything that might soften the blow, public sector employment, vital local industries, education and healthcare, price fixing for basic necessities, as well as food and agricultural subsidies. The IMF report on a country's compliance with these demands also determines whether that country will be a recipient of overseas development aid from Western donors. Adherence to neoliberal orthodoxies takes precedence over a regime's responsibility, either to the donors or to its own people. It's no surprise then if you look at the Wikipedia entry on, on the IMF to find such a close connection between it and 21 of the worst military dictatorships over the last 30 years. Even in countries that are not any more run by dictatorships. The effects of these policies on the poor and the most vulnerable is nothing short of violence, with the, with the economy stagnating and millions thrust into abject poverty and even starvation by IMF-imposed policies. The type of economic responsibility demanded by the IMF conditions does not have to extend to actual economic responsibility in the way that we, that we would logically understand it. Most of the dictatorships that enjoyed IMF clean bills of health and, favor, and favorable loan and aid terms actually grew their debt. Um, so, to come to Argentina, Ar Argentina ought to be an extremely rich country by global standards. It has a wealth of natural resources and the second largest land mass in Latin America. 
Um, efforts by state intervention to develop Argentine capitalism were very successful. By the 1920s, Argentina was the 10th richest country in the world. Uh, in the 1950s, it was on its way to being uh, an economy co comparable to that of Australia and Canada. 1976 saw a coup which signaled the end of this. A coup where the generals trained at the School of the Americas in Quantico, Virginia, imprisoned, tortured, raped, executed, and disappeared scores of thousands. While the IMF, while with IMF approval, economists trained at the Chicago School set about dismantling the perilous state-led economy. With, with popular opposition crushed and credit flowing, the generals unleashed a laissez-faire and privatization orgy on the economy, while simultaneously pocketing huge swathes of the loot. Their policies led to such economic mismanagement that a massive transfer of private debt into public hands had taken place, to the tune of 35 billion US dollars in bank bailouts alone. Unemployment rocketed and the gap between rich and poor widened. The debt became crippling and the economy weakened. In 1981, the IMF was called in officially to tend to Argentina's sick economy. His prescription for the patient that neoliberal policies had already made ill was for more of the same. The economy didn't recover, needless to say. But in 1983, the generals were finally ousted after their humiliating Malvinas escapade against the British. Civilian rule returned, and after some more years of economic uncertainty, the 1989 presidential elections returned Carlos Menem, again a perilous, but this time one of outly wedded to neoliberal policies. With the military's corruption occurred, the pegging of peso to the US dollar, and the release of capital, and the release of capital under privatization, uh, there was the semblance of an economic recovery. This so-called miracle, however, didn't last, as the massive capital inflows which were brought about by selling off the state oil company and the major utilities were only once off. The borrowed money required to keep the peso pegged to the dollar increased the IMF approved loans. Um, and, and, and the debt only grew. By the 1990s, the economy was a basket case with increasing proportions of much needed cash being diverted away from domestic economy into the multi-billion dollar external debt. In 2001 came the default. Argentina's crisis had deepened to the point where it just could not pay. It defaulted on 95 billion US dollars. The crisis had by now provoked a run on the banks. The middle classes saw their savings and pensions evaporate, and companies and even state employers began not to pay workers' wages. Over the next 12 months, the economy all but collapsed. GDP, GDP fell by 16%, unemployment almost doubled to 25%, and underemployment reached 20%, with 50% of the population now falling below the poverty line. Huge swathes of the middle classes had become declassed and pauperized. Um, in this period, there were four, gov four governments were elected and, and four subsequently fell. Each one fell under the pressure of, of, of a groundswell of popular movement because it had gone back to the IMF to look for a rescue package, which was duly offered under crippling conditions unacceptable to the people. Eventually, in May 2003, the newly elected government of Nestor Kirchner, a perilist again, saw the light. Kirchner pledged not to return to paying the debt at the cost of hunger and exclusion of Argentines and broke the rules of, international, of the international lenders. <clears throat> he refused to pay back the debt and refused the IMF's terms. He refused to bargain with debtors, giving them a deadline in 2005 by, by which they had to sign up to accepting 35% of the debt. This they did, and in the meanwhile, Kirchner, the Kirchner government in, reinvested the much needed money in the economy, which recovered rapidly. In the first two years, Argentina's GDP grew by an average of 9%. Unemployment levels halved, poverty diminished significantly, and the economy was considered robust enough by lenders and investors to return. By the end of the decade, it was, in, it was business as usual for the lending markets, and Argentina was renegotiating the terms of its loans from the Paris Club of Lenders, and, from, and its relationship with the IMF was re-established. Kirchner had done the unthinkable. He had broken the rules set by the international lenders. He had defaulted on 95 billion in debt. He had defied the IMF and allowed the Argentine economy to recover. He had done all this because the Argentinian people had made him do it. They had left him no choice. In turn, he left the IMF and the lenders no choice, and they acceded to his demands. Surely there are, lesson, there are, there are lessons in this story for us.